Jason, I'm back today with another episode in our ongoing series of Python cybersecurity mini projects. Here's just a quick reminder in case this is your first video in the series. These mini projects are made to be beginner friendly. If right now you just have a basic grasp of Python syntax, you know what a loop, a variable and a function is, then these videos are the perfect way to start using that fundamental knowledge in a more applied manner. So for these mini projects, I'll be doing multiple videos so that we can progressively increase the complexity, but of course not simply for complexity's sake, but rather so we can build more powerful programs and ultimately understand them better. I also want to mention that these projects are not only great for beginners to actually learn and become better at Python, but also for anyone looking to build a portfolio and break into cybersecurity. And once any specific mini project ends, I'll give you a number of ideas of how you can continue to build on them in case you wanted to go off and use this as a starting point to do your own larger project, which I highly encourage. Napoleon, like anyone can even know that. So in today's third and final lesson on firewalls, we'll take our simple DOS blocker we made in the previous lesson, and we'll add a few important elements. First, we'll equip it with both a white and blacklist, allowing us to either explicitly allow or deny specific IPs entry to our network. Then we'll add a rudimentary signature detection ability, allowing our firewall to be on the lookout for known malicious code. And finally, we'll add an element crucial to anything firewall related, logging. So don't let its simplicity obscure its importance. In cybersecurity, keeping logs of all events is absolutely essential. Logging. Before we dive into the script, let's take a quick moment to review signature detection. So signature detection is simply a method used in network security to identify malicious activity by looking at the contents of each packet and comparing it to a known database of signatures associated with malicious software. If it identifies a packet containing such a signature from the database, the firewall will drop the packet and block the source IP. And also just so you are aware, these signatures can take a number of different forms like strings, patterns, behaviors, etc. They can get quite complex and new versions even include machine learning. But for simplicity's sake, and since we're only trying to grasp the underlying principles and not really rebuild the fully fledged firewall here, we'll focus specifically on the simplest form called string detection. So our firewall will be on the lookout for a packet that contains a specific string, i.e. line of code, associated with the Nimda worm. And two final things before we get coding, I do want to mention that right at the top of the description, you can find the links to the actual script and the test script we'll use to simulate the traffic. I do recommend downloading these so you can focus on the lesson without needing to constantly pause and copy the code. And finally, since this is our last lesson on firewalls, I want to mention that if you stick around to the end, stick around. I'll give you some more ideas of how you can build on this firewall in case you were inspired to go off and make this a project of your own. So let's get to it. So here is the entire script. Let's quickly get a lay of the land. Right up top, we import all the necessary modules as well as define our threshold variable. We then define all our functions. First, a function for reading IPs from a file, which is used for our white and blacklist. The next function is then used to see if a packet contains the Nimda worm signature. After this is our logging function. Here we have our packet callback function, which handles the processing of each packet. And finally, we have our main function, which handles all the core functionality. Okay, so now that we've looked at the big picture, let's jump in and analyze each line individually. First, we import the OS library to interact with the operating system, allowing us to execute system commands such as IP tables. We import the sys library to access system specific parameters and functions, such as exiting the script with an error code. We import the time library to track time intervals, allowing us to determine a transfer rate for the packets. We import default dict from the collections library to simplify our packet counting logic. We import the sniff, IP and TCP functions from the scapey.all module to capture, analyze and manipulate network packets. So once we're done importing modules, we'll set the threshold constant here to 40, which basically just means if any IP sends data in excess of 40 packets per second, we will block that IP. So next up, let's have a look at our read IPs function, which we'll use for the processing of our white and black lists. Here we define the function read IP file, which receives the argument file name and reads a file containing a list of IP addresses. We open the file with a given file name in read mode and use a context manager to automatically close the file after reading. We use a list comprehension to read each line in the file, remove any leading or trailing whitespace and store the IP addresses in a list. We return the list of IP addresses as a set to eliminate duplicates and optimize lookup operation. Next, let's have a look at our nimda function, which will be used to detect the nimda worm signature. 
We define the function isNimdaWorm, which takes the argument packet and checks if it contains a signature associated with the NimdaWorm. We check if the packet has a TCP layer and if its destination port is 80, indicating that it's an HTTP request. We extract the payload from the TCP layer of the packet. We return true if the payload contains the NimdaWorm signature get forward slash scripts forward slash root.exe, otherwise we return false. Next, let's have a look at our logging function, which will be used to log events. We define the function log event, which takes the argument message and writes it to a log file with a timestamp. We create a variable log folder and set its value to the string logs, representing the folder where log files will be stored. We use the os.makeDirs function to create the logs folder if it doesn't already exist and set exists underscore ok to true to avoid raising an error if the folder already exists. We create a timestamp variable and format it using the current local time with the format displayed here. We create the log file variable and set its value to the full path of the log file using the log folder and the formatted timestamp. We open the log file in append mode using a context manager which will automatically close the file after writing. We write the message to the log file followed by a new line character to separate entries. Next we'll define the callback function which is used to execute all packet operations. We define the function packet callback which receives the argument packet and processes it according to our firewall rules. We extract the source IP from the IP layer of the packet. We check if the source IP IP addresses in the whitelist IP set. If so, we return immediately without further processing. We check if the source IP address is in the blacklist IP set. If so, we proceed to block the IP address. We execute a system command to add an IP tables rule that drops incoming packets from the blacklisted source IP address. We call the log event function to write a message to the log file indicating that we are blocking a blacklisted IP address. We check if the packet contains the nimdaworm signature by calling the isNimdaWorm function. We print a message to the console indicating that we are blocking the nimda source IP. We execute a system command to add an IP tables rule that drops incoming packets from the source IP address associated with the nimdaworm. And again, we'll also call the log event function. We increment the packet count for the source IP address in the packet count dictionary. We retrieve the current time using the time.time function and store it in the current time variable. We calculate the time interval between the current time and the start time by subtracting start time from the current time. We check if the time interval is equal to or greater than one second. We iterate through the packet count dictionary, getting the source IP address and the packet count for each entry. We calculate the packet rate by dividing the packet count by the time interval. We check if the packet rate exceeds the threshold and if the IP address is not already in the blocked IP set. We print a message to the console indicating that we are blocking an IP address due to its excessive packet rate. We'll then once again use IP tables as well as the log event function to block the IP address and log the event. Here we then block the IP address to the blocked IP set and we do this in order to prevent duplicate blocking attempts. We clear the packet count dictionary to reset the counts for the next time interval. We update the start time value with the current time to begin a new time interval. And finally, let's look at the main function. We then use the main guard to call the main function. We check if the script is being executed with root privileges. If it is not, we'll print an error message and exit the script with an error code. We call the read IP file function to read the whitelist text file and store the return set of whitelisted IP addresses in the whitelist IPs variable. And we'll once again call the read IP file function to read the blacklist text file and store the return set of blacklisted IP addresses in the blacklist IPs variable. We create a default dict called packet count, which will store the packet count for each IP address. By default, the value for any non-existent key will be an integer initialized to zero. We create a list called start time containing a single element, the current time. We use this to keep track of the beginning of each time interval. We create an empty set called block IPs to store the IP addresses that have been blocked. We print a message to the console indicating that the script is now monitoring network traffic. And last but not least, we call the sniff function from the SCAPI library, filtering only IP packets and specifying the packet callback function to be called for each captured packet. The script will continue to run and process packets until it's interrupted by the user. Great, so that's it for the code. Now let's get to the fun bit and actually test it. All right, before we get going, please keep in mind that if you do want to test the white and blacklist components, you would have to include the whitelist.txt and blacklist.txt files in the same folder as the script. 
So in order to test our firewall, I'll be running two separate VMs. On the left is Gitcode, which will be running the firewall. And on the right we have Timecop, which will be running a simple script which will send a packet containing a Nimda worm signature. So I'm not going to review that entire script now, but in case you were interested, here it is. Please pause and have a good look if you'd like. I also just want to mention that you don't have to worry, this is completely benign, it does not really send the Nimda worm, it just sends a small section of the code that constitutes our string based signature. So first let's run the IP tables command on gitgood to confirm that indeed currently there are no IPs being blocked. And we can see that our table is empty. Alright so let's actually go ahead and start our firewall on gitgood, just please remember that you have to run it using sudo. And we can see that our firewall is currently running. So now let's head over to Timecop to send our Nimda worm packet. And we can see that we've successfully sent the packet. And we can see that immediately our firewall was able to detect the packet and block the offending IP. Let's look at our IP tables again to confirm that indeed the offending IP was blocked. And we can see it right there. All right, so now just one final thing. Back on Gitcode, let's go into the logs folder. And now let's have a look at the contents. And we can see that indeed we have a single log file with a timestamp. Let's concatenate the contents. And we can see the record that we detected the Nimda worm packet as well as the offending IP. And one final thing, in case you wanted to, just remember to remove the IP from the IP tables, otherwise they won't be able to communicate to each other. Okay, so if you followed along, take a moment to congratulate yourself. You've carved out the crude beginnings of a firewall. <laughs> yes, everything was very simplified, but at the same time, we've covered what a firewall is doing at its core. So now, in case this line of inquiry tickles your fancy, I invite you to explore it further. And to that end, here are three suggestions on how you can build on these projects to get in deeper with firewalls. First, implement alerting. So today we've added a logging ability, but of course, if certain critical events are detected, it would be important for us to receive a notification via, for example, email or text message straight away. If you go ahead and build out this feature, it'll teach you a lot about using APIs, which will literally open up a whole new dimension of what you can do with Python. In 2023 and beyond, understanding APIs is at the core of nearly everything related to software, including cybersecurity. Number two, integrate with a web-based dashboard. You can go ahead and create a web-based dashboard that visualizes the data collected by the script in real time. We can display information such as the number of packets processed, blocked IPs, detected malware signatures, and packet rates. And if you want to get extra fancy, you can even include geodata, so it'll display where in the world the blocked IPs are originating from. You can build this dashboard using a Python framework like Flask or Django, as well as a JavaScript charting library like Chart.js or D3.js. This project will teach you all about web development, which will come in handy for apps bug bounty, and really anything related to the web. And finally, you can also go ahead and expand on the signature detection abilities. So today we created a very simple signature detection ability that is looking for the string related to the Nimda worm. Now you can go ahead and build on that. Look at sites like OWASP to learn all about other common network attacks like SQL, XSS, RFI, etc. Learn about their signatures and think about the relationship between these signatures and what it is these attacks are actually doing. If you do this, you'll gain a tremendous amount of insight into network threats, how they work, and importantly, how they can be prevented. There's not a single area of cybersecurity that this will not intersect with, so it'll be a great project for you to go ahead and do. Okay, friends, so that's it for our series on firewalls. If you enjoyed it, please consider detecting the like button signature or whitelisting a subscription to this channel. Our next series will cover network scanners. It's gonna be awesome, I promise. Until then, peace out. Thank you.